Um, so I uh, started writing some notes about what to say today and was talking with Len about it at the AAA meetings and I think basically what he said was stop, you're supposed to react. But I, I was worried that I might not have a way to organize my reaction unless I had something to hang it off of. Um, and I was not part of the collusive cabal between CPA Ontario and CPAB that committed beforehand not to prepare slides. So I think that's why I'm up here first, is because I have, I, I was outside of the loop on that one. Um, so I do want to relate what I'm about to talk to to sort of the remarks that I've heard earlier today. So I would say different from Chris Itner, um, I come from a very different institution. There are three important institutions in the state of Pennsylvania, Penn, Penn State, and the state Penn. <laughs> Two of those are in State College. One of them is in Philadelphia. And Penn State is different from Penn because the campus where I work is the source of uh, the largest, uh, is the largest source of talent for three of the big four firms in the United States. So we are all about training new entrants into the accounting profession. We are a very large accounting program and we serve markets in New York and Philadelphia and Washington and Baltimore and Pittsburgh. If you add up all those places, there's a tremendous amount of work that gets done there. And in thinking about what I would say today, um, I wanted to talk about the structure of the profession rather than as much as I think we've heard today about the outputs of the profession. And I particularly wanted to do that because the people who are part of the, the panel are members of the professional association and the regulator that supervises their activities. And so I thought if I were provocative now, that would definitely give um, Jeremy and Gord things to react to. So I'm getting to go. Um, but before I did that, I, maybe I want to take a page from the, uh, the, the Catherine Jackson and Audrey DeMerico by um, saying some things that I heard, uh, had heard other smart people say at a conference. And so the plenary session, the first plenary session of the American Accounting Association meetings this year in San Diego featured three very prominent members of um, academic accounting. Bob Swearinga, who looks at things from many perspectives because he's been the dean of a very prestigious business school. He's been a FASB board member. Uh, I think he's currently a director of GE, and so I think he thinks very broadly about the role of accountants in society. Um, Kathy Schran from the University of Pennsylvania, who's the founding editor of a new journal in accounting, the Journal of Financial Reporting, and Bob Kaplan, who was identified at that meeting as um, the Dwight Eisenhower of accounting. And I'm not quite old enough to know what that means, but I think it's good. Um, and I, I think that, that, that Bob has that role because a lot of um, thinking about KPIs and um, balanced score, scorecards and ways of motivating people within organizations are ultimately attributable um, back to Bob. And they all offered perspectives on making research more relevant to practitioners. And I think that's one of the goals of this meeting. And so I wanted to kind of highlight my takeaways from their comments. So Do Bob talked about strengthening connections to practice. And he urged the academics that he was addressing at the American Accounting Association meeting to spend more time speaking with practitioners, to go to their conferences, to read their professional work, including professional journals, laws, regulations, court records, analyst reports to really understand better the institutional arrangements in which things operate. And I, I think that's an excellent piece of idea, uh, advice that people should do that. Um, Kathy spoke about enhancing the journal review process um, and she encouraged researchers to do more exploratory and descriptive research and actually to get it published and to, to have senior faculty um, write more monographs and contribute to handbooks, which I think was to spend more time not necessarily doing research, but synthesizing research and trying to push that back out into the community of accountants, and particularly into the practitioner world. And I think that's an excellent piece of advice um, to undertake as well for, for the profession. And I would say, Miguel, by Kathy's lights, your paper should have been published a long time ago, because I think it fits squarely with the types of things that she was encouraging the profession to think about overall. And, and I, I, I think that's unfortunate. And I, I, I think there are issues within the way accounting academia is organized, and there's ways of thinking about doing that. And Bob was actually on the topic of, well, how can we make things better? So he wanted to propose some KPIs, I guess you could think of it that way, or revisions to academic performance evaluation, and said, you know, stop sending your paper only to the top three journals, send it to some place where 
um, you know, the best audience or the best audience is going to be able to, to read your work, um, and measure faculty time spent on outreach. And the last one, that matters to me because I'm the chair of a department. There's 30 people who work in the same unit that I do, and I have a big influence over what happens to them professionally. Um, it's worth thinking about, right, to create incentives for people to, to spend more time actually um, doing research someplace um, other than in their offices. And then I want to just talk a little bit about different research types. So the kind that maybe I've done the most of is ex ante modeling of how the world would look different if we were to change the regulatory environment or do things somewhat differently. Um, or even do laboratory experiments and see how people behave in different settings. And I think there's a real potential for that to inform um, the operation of the regulatory environment, the operation of practitioners. Um, there's also ex post evaluation using empirical archival methods to sort of think about the regulatory consequences or the consequences of the regulation. Again, I point to Miguel's discussion earlier today is one where I think that was the intent, was to assess the consequences of regulatory change and we should do more of that. Um, I like to think about so how to describe research to people who maybe don't do it all that often. And so I want to use the analogy of the lab, the zoo, and the safari. So a lot of accounting research gets done kind of at the university in a laboratory <coughs> environment where we're looking at data, we're trying to conduct experiments, develop hypotheses, test conclusions, and so on. Um, and that's important, right? In biomedical research, we do work in the lab. There's also what I would call um, going to the zoo. So I don't know you get a lot of research done at the zoo, but I would say we're all at the zoo today, right? I'm a fairly exotic creature for those of you who are in practice. And for me, those of you who are in practice are really quite exotic creatures. And it's nice to kind of walk up and touch you. I sort of hope you don't bite me when I talk to you. But that interaction, that first familiarity with some creature from a different part of life is, is really interesting and important to do. Um, what I think we don't do enough of is go on safari, right? So going actually out in the world and trying to understand the institutional arrangements better than we do now. We spend too much time in the lab, I would argue, and not enough time on safari. And I'd like to find ways um, as, a, as a profession, as an academic discipline, to be more often out on safari. OK. Um, this is the only algebra in my presentation, and I realize there's a mistake in it. But I, although I am a dues-paying member of CPA Canada, and I worked briefly for a public accounting firm in Toronto, <coughs> Since Ronald Reagan was president, I have lived in the United States. And so what I know about the environment is basically the American environment. And I think PCAOB equals CPAB plus AASB, which is to say that PCAOB kind of promulgates auditing standards. And they're also the enforcement mechanism for inspecting practices and so on. And those two things are in different um, bodies within um, the Canadian setting. And I apologize for missing one of the A's. I think it's the assurance A in AASB. Um, but then if I think about what happened in the American market, there was this thing called Socks. And that reminds me of a poem by Dr. Zeus called, Oh, the Jobs People Work At. Out west near Hotch Hotch, there's a Hotch Hotch bee watcher. His job is to watch, is to keep both eyes on the lazy town bee. A bee that's watched will work harder, you see. Well, he watched and he watched, but in spite of watching, the bee didn't work much harder, not much. So then somebody said, our old bee watching man just isn't bee watching as hard as he can. He ought to be watched by another hotch hotcher. The thing we need is a bee watch watcher. Well, the bee watch watcher watched the bee watcher. He didn't watch well. So another hotch hotcher had to come in as a watch watcher watcher. And today all the hotchers who live in hotch hotch are watching on watch, 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 or it goes on. Um, I think you get the idea that we're in this environment where sort of everyone is checking on everyone else's work. And public accounting as a profession these days, I think, is plagued by what you might call hotch hotchery. So there is the preparer who is subject to internal quality assurance that work of the preparer is then examined by the external auditor. And inside of those organizations, one of the things which matters a lot to those auditors is their internal quality assurance mechanism. So they are subject to the standards of their firm and review practices within their firm, and there are sanctions and penalties there. And then on top of that, there's a layer of regulatory review, which sort of looks at the work for the umpteenth time. 
Um, it's a good question to ask, a researchable question, I think, to what extent has the work of the PCOB or the CPAB um, helped the process. And one of the things that I think has happened, which is a very, I would regard it as a disturbing anecdote in the United States, is that a lot of people who used to work for the PCOB now work for um, the public accounting firms. And so this is the blue firm. I'm going to use Miguel's language. Um, and I have this in quotation marks. I'm not sure I should. I, I think I snatched it from a speech that uh, John V. Mayer made on the, uh, and it was on the web at some point. But I was trying to find it yesterday evening. And I couldn't lay my hands on it. So if he didn't actually say this, I was definitely in a room where I heard him make remarks that were essentially of this type. And he's very critical of the inspection process in the United States because it's so onerous and the standardization, regardless of utility, and the zero defect mentality is so oppressive that audit partners at the blue firm that the firm would like to retain are leaving and going elsewhere to do more rewarding work. That's a tremendously serious accusation about the organization of the profession. And I think that's something that deserves serious academic inquiry. It's coming from someone who ought to know um, and apparently making it very, very clear. Now, the Blue Firm also got into some trouble in 2017 because in February, there was a KPMG whistleblower who reported that an employee who formerly worked for the PCOB received and shared confidential PCOB information with other KPMG employees. When KPMG found out about it, they informed the PCOB and the, and the SEC. Both, firm, uh, both the PCOB and the KPMG kind of lawyered up to investigate what was going on. Um, and the PCOB employee who leaked the information is no longer with um, the PCOB. By April, it had come out that um, the vice chair of audit and a senior national managing partner in audit quality um, had all been let go from KPMG for having, it seemed like, heard from the PCOB who the PC, which clients of KPMG the PCOB intended to audit and had not sort of like immediately disclosed this information. And then three other people, um, partners in the firm and an unidentified employee were also let go. Um, this comes in the context of a situation where KPMG had been identified as having the highest rates of deficiency by the PCOB in 2015 and 2016. Um, the rate of deficiencies um, was looked like pretty high. Um, but it's in this hotch, hotch kind of context. So it's a good question to ask how serious um, those defects are. And I think this is an anecdote. There's a lot of stuff that's sort of, if this is the tip of the iceberg, there's stuff going on underneath. Um, People inside of this firm have told me that um, for all of the large public accounting firms in the United States, a major area of recruiting lately has been hiring staff away from the PCOB to staff up their own internal practice inspection process so that presumably um, when the PCOB inspectors come on board that there's more understanding inside the firm of what the PCOB's reasoning is and, and, and ultimately I think maybe the, the, the audit product itself is actually um, constructed better and is more valuable in the marketplace. But still it's, it's very disturbing to see this kind of revolving door. It's not unique to audit regulation, right? The public accounting firms have long rotated staff through um, and I guess here it would be like Revenue Canada or through the Treasury Department and thinking about um, enforcement and, and regulatory matters related to taxation and through the Public Accountant's Office and so on. So these are um, happening all over the place. But this seems like a really big issue that ought to be investigated. Um, is the defects only method of practice inspection really helping the public accounting profession? I, I think that's worth asking. I, w I was struck by stuff that was said by um, Johannes Pastor, when he talked about the importance of achieving consistency in judgments, and I, I think he meant sort of the, the effort that went behind the auditing a number within a, public, within a public accounting firm and across public accounting firms, that consistency is safe for auditors. But I also think that kind of puts them into the business of selling a commodity and having no way to distinguish themselves from other suppliers of the service than to be really cost effective at it. And if instead there was some way to, to, to offer a differentiated product, to have a more valuable type of audit, to offer a higher level of assurance, there might be some differentiation in the marketplace that might be valuable for firms. And so it's kind of disheartening to hear that 
when the long form audit report came out, it didn't seem to have many effects. It didn't seem to change the kinds of things that um, auditors were going to report on or, or to result in some auditors providing a substantially different product for which they were able to charge different fees. That seems kind of discouraging. I sort of <coughs> like to think that there was more variety of this marketplace and it wasn't all about doing the minimum work necessary to meet the professional standard. Steve? Yep. So last anecdote is um, about this SF partnership. So I started reading some PCOB import reports. This um, Canadian public accounting firm was inspected by the PCOB in 2011 and 2016. Deficiencies were found in 2011. I think none were found in 2016. But if you, know, and you don't get to see a lot of the report when you read the PCOB part one. Um, but it was clear that they were auditing fewer public issuers in the United States, and it was clear they were a much smaller firm than they had been. So if nothing else, the fact that the PCOB had complained about their work seemed to have made them smaller and give them fewer clients. Maybe that's a good outcome. But you could also wonder about whether they could have been repaired and improved and maybe grown through the experience, or whether the PCOB inspection process is in some way serving to protect a cartel, a small number of firms that are um, in the business and preventing entry by other firms. I mean, there's a lot of competitive effects in the industrial structure of public accounting that really seem like they're worth examining. Um, so let me just stop there and say, I hope I have inflamed the passions of the CPAB and CPA Canada, but I welcome their reactions to what I've said. Thank you. <laughs>